Well, while we wait... <laughs> okay, just kidding. He's on his way. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just spilled water all over myself, so I apologize. I, I didn't pee on myself. I, it's my water all over my... <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So, <laughs> apologize. All right, well, we're in First John, but we're going to uh, just make a couple announcements real quick. Uh, we, this will be our last Bible study on First John. Okay, so next week, there'll be no Bible study. We always take a break after the Bible study. And then because of the, the holidays and the end of the year, uh, the following Wednesday, even after that, there'll be no Bible study. So the next two weeks, we're off. No Bible studies. We come back the Wednesday, the first Wednesday in the new year, and that'll be kind of a special service. Uh, it won't actually be a Bible study. We're going to have Brother uh, Brian Dorsey bring the, bring the word. Praise the Lord. So that'll be exciting. We're actually going to do, it's kind of going to be a, a service. We'll do, you know, praise and worship, and, and he'll go ahead and, and give the word. So please be here for that. That'll be the first Wednesday. I believe it's January 6th uh, in December. I mean, uh, January. So first Wednesday. Now here's another announcement. After that, we start a new Bible study, which will be in the book of Mark, Gospel of Mark, but we're going to change the time for our Bible studies going forward. It'll be starting at 7, okay? All right, so we're going to have a change of time in the new year. So that's, that's a lot. Uh, just remember, we're going to keep going with our normal 8 o'clock Bible study, um, well, 8 o'clock time. When Brian Dorsey preaches, January 6th. After that, when we start the book of Mark, which will be January 13th, we change our time going forward to the new time for Bible studies, which will be 7 o'clock, which we think, you know, will help some people. A lot of people get up early in the morning, so it's hard getting back late at night. Uh, they get up early for work or, or bringing their kids to school or uh, plus, you know, driving later at night if, you know, maybe some of uh, the elderly people have a hard time with that. So uh, we, we hope it'll be a blessing to you and, and help people. Uh, so we're going to get the word out. If you didn't get it all tonight, we'll re be repeating it over and over until you guys get it. Uh, so don't worry about it now. So it's a little far off before we change the time. But uh, I, I did want to start announcing that now. Okay? Praise God. All right. Hopefully you got your Bibles. You're in First John. We're going to pick up with you. Uh, First John chapter 5. And so... Let's go ahead and read. This is where we actually, we started this last week, this verse. We're at the beginning of the chapter. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loves him, that begat, loves him also, that is begotten of him. By this, we know that we love the children of God. And when we, have, and when we love God and keep his commandments. All right. So, of course, this is, this is John writing. He's writing to believers. He's telling believers, uh, you know, John is, is writing a, an explanation of, of Jesus, who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Messiah. He came in the flesh. He is, he is countering docetism, which believes that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Docetism believes, you know, God couldn't have showed up in flesh because this material world is evil and God is good, and there's no way that God could have come in the flesh. That's the very opposite of what the Bible teaches, okay? The Word became flesh, John says in, in John chapter 1, verse 14, and, and dwelt among us. So John here, of course, is, is countering that. So he's telling them, he's giving them assurances, uh, particularly in the last chapter, we see a lot of ways to be assured that you're believing the right thing, to be assured that you are a Christian, that you are born again. You have to believe certain things. So whenever some people maybe question their faith, uh, I always bring them to 1 John chapter 4 and chapter 5. You can just walk through the verses that say, this is what assures you that you're really a, a Christian, that you're really born again. Because the devil, you know, was always going to lie to people and tell people, you know, look what you've done. You couldn't possibly be a Christian. But we need to understand 
The Bible says we are a Christian not based on what we've done or haven't done. It's based on what we believe Jesus has done, what we believe who he is and what he's done on that cross. So John is, is reiterating this over and over that you've got to believe on Jesus, believe he is the Messiah, the Christ, believe he came in the flesh, and three, believe he is the Son of God. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, which means uh, the anointed one, the Messiah of God, the one and only Messiah of God come to save the world, he is born of God. So this is assurance. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Well, you're born of God. And everyone that loves him, that begot, loves him also, that is begotten of him. Okay? So we love the Father. Of course, that means we, by default, love the Son. Because, you know, loving, the, when you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. When you see the Father, you've seen the Son. When you love one, you love the other. It's also talking about loving those that are begotten through Jesus Christ. In other words, the brethren. The, the, the body of Christ. Everyone that loves him that begot loves him also that is begotten of him. Talking about the body of Christ as well. By this we know that we love the children of God. Okay? So when we love God and keep his commandments. So first, let's talk about we love the children of God. By loving God, by default, again, we're loving the children of God, the offspring of God. Because we're, uh, you know, of the same family. And when we love the children of God, we're loving God. So if you love God, by default, you love the children of God. And if you love the children of God, you love God, okay? Because there are those, even in churches, that try to sow discord and disharmony among the brother, that try to destroy churches, that try to split churches, that try to uh, uh, subvert uh, the working of God in churches. So the devil's got people stationed, I'm convinced, in all kinds of churches all around the world, uh, that are sowing discord among the brethren, that are trying to split the brethren, that are trying to uh, pull away people from uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ and start splitting them. So we always have to be aware of dissension. That's not of God. And anyone that's trying to destroy a church in that way, of course, is not of God, is of the devil. So then he says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments, okay? So when we love God, we, 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 by nature, this is our, our desire, our heart, is to keep his commandments. And what's he talking about here? Well, he's talking particularly about the commandments of love. Okay? Um, I'm just going to read this. You don't have to turn here. But in John 13, you're, I'm sure you're aware, it talks about a new commandment I give unto you. Jesus said this in John 13, verse uh, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another of course we we know he taught jesus taught the the commandment to love the lord thy god with all the heart with all the strength with all the might and to love your neighbor as yourself so jesus taught that love and 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 then he says this this is a new commandment that you love one another as i have loved you that you also love one another verse 35 says by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have a love one to another so this, again, this is proof that you're born again, that you love the brethren. Because when you love the brethren, you love God. And as you love God, you love the brethren. So, the, but, but what is interesting is Jesus not only did what he taught, which is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself, he went far beyond that. He laid down his life for his brethren. So not only did he love his neighbor as, his, as himself, he actually loved them more. <laughs> Hallelujah. He loved us more by laying down his life. So then he tells us to do the same thing, to love the brethren, be willing to lay down your life for the brethren, for someone in the body of Christ, willing to die for your brethren. That is a, that's a supernatural love. That's, that's not the kind of love that any man naturally has. You must be born again to exhibit that kind of love. It is a, a God kind of love, a spiritual love, willing to prefer your brother to lay down your life for someone else. So w you must be born again to exhibit that kind of love. That is absolutely contrary to the ways of the world and the ways of the flesh. So uh, we, we need the grace of God to be able to even c keep this commandment uh, to love thy neighbor and to love as Christ has loved us. So and then it goes on to explain this love. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. 
So if we, we, we love God, we're going to want to keep his commandments. By nature, it's what we do as Christians. We're born again with that, that innate desire to please the Father, to do the will of the Father, to, to give our lives uh, to God. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So again, this is our nature to want to keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. See, that, this is, grievous means to be heavy, to be weighty, to be, to be burdensome. Literally and, and uh, metaphorically, it means to be oppressive. Our God is not an oppressive God. The God of, of all these other religions, particularly I'm thinking of Islam, is very oppressive, very violent. Our God is not grievous. Uh, his commandments are not grievous. His commandments, he says in Matthew 11, again, you don't have to turn here, but you're familiar with the scripture. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And here it is. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hallelujah. It is light. He, he is not a God that will oppress God is a good God. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. He loves his children. He, he blesses and gives to his children, willing to die for his children. So, uh, you know, a, as opposed to the, the, the God of Islam, you, you know, uh, I mean, he just seems to be a God of war, a God of hate. He, he demands that his servants uh, die for him. And that's the only way they can be guaranteed heaven is, is to die in a holy jihad. And even then, you're not necessarily guaranteed. Uh, you can do everything right in Islam, pray, you know, three times a day and go to Mecca and fast and give and all these things that you're supposed to do. And still, you're not guaranteed anything. You're not guaranteed to go to their version of heaven. Uh, so their, their God is a violent God, the very opposite. But our God is a God who is... Uh, whose burden is light, praise God. So uh, his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, praise God. Well, that's us. John is making the case throughout this book that you're born of God, you're born again, you're a believer. So he's saying now you need to know the result of that is that you have overcome the world. That, world, that word overcome is in the, Aorotus, which means the past. In other words, it's already done. The moment you made Jesus Christ your Lord, you had faith in what he did on that cross. Hallelujah. That's when you got the victory. And this is the thing. It's also going forward, forever true for your life, every day, forever and ever, as you're in Christ, you have overcome the world. Praise God. It is our uh, new position for all of eternity. We have overcome the world. What is the world? I think the best definition I've ever seen is in Thayer's uh, lexicon. He said, this is the world. It is worldly affairs. The aggregate, the aggregate of things earthly. The whole circle of earthly goods, endowments, riches, advantages, pleasures, etc., which... Uh, although hollow and frail and fleeting, stir desire, seduce from God, and are obstacles to the cause of Christ. Oh, I just like that. We have overcome the world, the, the desires of the world, the passions of the world, the sins of the world, as long as we are in Christ. Again, it was something done in the past. It was really done on that cross, past. Yet going forward from that moment, we put faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are forever overcomers. Glory to God. These are one, this is one of those verses where you get discouraged. You can go to this verse and say, I have overcome. Hallelujah. We have already overcome by our faith in what Jesus did in that finished work. Praise God. We have overcome. We're not trying to. We're, we're not trying to get God to make us overcome. We've got to realize our position is in Christ. We have overcome you can't do anything 
to be any more of an overcomer. You simply believe and rest in that work that Christ has done, that wonderful finished work. Praise God. We are overcomers. So uh, for whatsoever is born, uh, is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcome, overcomes the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. Well, this is how we do it. It's not our works, what we do. God's not impressed with how spiritual you are. It's simply by our faith. Our faith, the word faith means a firm belief or a firm conviction. What is it we're convinced of, convicted of, is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who came in the flesh, died on that cross for our sins, and rose again. That is our firm firm. Con conviction and that's what makes us children of God that what's that's what assures us of our faith that you are a believer you are in Christ and because of that you have overcome the world glory to God verse 5 praise God amen who is he that overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the son of God I love John he just breaks it down he just explains uh, what he just said who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Again, he repeats himself. I had a, a preacher said, uh, in fact, not, not long ago, he said to me, God broke me of the fear of repetition. Because preachers like to repeat themselves, and they don't want to sometimes, but this is the only way to really get your point across, is to repeat yourself. So John is here repeating himself. Jesus is the Son of God. This is what you must believe. Jesus is the Son of God. And, and let, me, let me stop there. And, and he's, there's, there, that th phrase is really pregnant with meaning. Jesus is the Son of God. He's really saying by implication that Jesus is the divine one. There is, it, we, we read in the Bible, he's the only begotten Son of God. That means there is no one like him. There is no one that is of his kind. He is unique. He is the only one. He is of the same uh, 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 constitution or, or, or substance that God, that the Father is made out of. He is the only one. He is God. He is eternal. Hallelujah. He is unchanging. Hallelujah. He is the Son of God. In other words, He is divine. And, and that's important because there are certain uh, cults out there. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, Mormons believe that, that Jesus had a brother. You know, well, if He had a brother, then they're, they're, he's not unique. He's not the only begotten son of God. There's two of them. And by the way, they used to believe that the brother of Jesus was Lucifer. Present day Jehovah's Witnesses do believe that. They believe that Jesus' brother is Lucifer. That's totally errant, totally wrong. The reason why uh, we consider them a cult. Uh, no, Jesus is the only one of his kind. Only one. He is divine. He is not a created being. He has existed eternity past and will exist in eternity future. Lucifer, all the angels, all of humanity are created beings. So he is unique, one of a kind. He is the son. That's another way of saying he is equal with God. He is the divine one. He is the son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. All right? So this is a, an area where you start to go, what is he talking about? This, this, he comes by water and blood. Some people, of course, there's probably a lot of interpretations out there. Uh, I happen to agree with the pastor. If you have the notes, you know what he says. If you don't, I'll tell you. Water means uh, it's representing coming by natural birth, human birth. Okay, he comes, you know, when a, a, a woman is about to give birth, what does she do? Her water breaks, okay? So we call it water. It's actually amniotic fluid is, the, I guess, the technical term. Her water breaks. Well, we all come that way. We all come uh, through water. The, uh, the baby swims in, in, in water, so to speak. All right, so we all come that way. So that is a, a it's talking about a, a testimony. He came this is evidence, this is proof he came as a man. Again, that's what John is trying to prove. He came in the flesh as a man born of a woman. It's the only way to get here on the planet Earth as a man is to come through a woman. So he's saying he came by water as testimony. Then the other testimony is he came by blood. Well, what's that talking about? 
Well, that's, that's talking about the end of his life, which is he died shedding his blood. Okay? So again, this is another testimony proving that Jesus Christ was a man. He came to the earth as a man. We might take that for granted, but, but this is very important because, number one, they were dealing with a lot of false doctrine back there, a bunch of Gnostic false doctrine that said he didn't come. Uh, he was a spirit being or whatever. Well, the, the same is true today. We have all kinds of weird doctrines. And if you're not established in this, in the word of God, you're, you're going to hear it and say, well, that, that might be true. That sounds good. Yeah. But, uh, again, in fact, I pointed out last time there are those that believe. Uh, again, I think it's Jehovah's Witness that, that he, he came as a man, but when he rose from the grave, he was only a spirit being. He didn't literally rise from the grave physically. Again, so we've got to know the word to be able to discern that is error. So, so, so again, John is trying to prove the case. He came as a man. He was born of water. He came by water and blood. And it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. All right? So the spirit is also on the earth, the, the Holy Ghost, we call him, or the Holy Spirit. And he bears witness to the truth. Well, how does he do that? Of course, he does that through the scripture, through the written word of God and through his, his uh, apostles, prophets, pastors and teachers uh, uh, preaching the word of God through his believers, the lay people, everyone. They, they had the spirit of God and they testify Jesus Christ did come. He is the son of God, the Messiah, the Christ that died on the cross and so forth. So uh, the spirit bears witness to this truth. Verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. So there he is. He's repeating himself, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Okay. Now this is a verse, verse 7 and part of verse 8, that is actually, uh, there's a lot of disagreement about this verse. I'm not going to try to get into all that stuff. You guys can go look it up for yourself if you want to learn about 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Uh, you can research that on your own. Uh, but let's just say this, that uh, it, it talks about the Father. Of course, we know that's the Father God, the Word, which is the Logos, which is uh, uh, the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Ghost, of course. And then it says, uh, there are three that bear witness in earth. So he's saying this is what God recognizes. This is the testimony of God and man that Jesus Christ came to the earth, born of a woman, born in water, uh, and the blood. Okay, Not everyone dies, but we know, of course, that he shed his blood. Uh, and, and the Bible talks about back in uh, uh, Genesis when uh, uh, Cain slew Abel, that his blood cried out. So the blood apparently has some kind of testimony before God. All right. We, we understand, of course, humanity will be judged. So there is a, a testimony that 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 uh, things and events of our life have a testimony about our actions and about the things that we've done. So apparently uh, Abel's blood cried out about the murder, about his own murder against uh, uh, his brother Cain. So the blood, the blood has a testimony of sorts. And then, of course, the spirit, these three agree in one so he's making the case that these three things agree that jesus did come he did come in the flesh he is the son of god all right now if we receive the witness of men the witness of god is greater for this is the witness of god which he hath testified of his son all right so we, you know, we, we receive the witness of men. We, we listen to men. We, we listen to, to what they say. Well, they say this is true and that is true and this is true. And, of course, he's making the case that this is so far greater than anything we know of man. That anything that man has ever told you, this is so far more true than anything. Uh, if, you, if you listen to men, to, the word witness means testimony or to testify. If we listen to the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. It's greater in, in power. It's greater in its authority. It's, it, it's greater in, in its value, praise God. This is the testimony of God. This is the, he's just kind of emphasizing this is the word of God, the testimony of God. Jesus came. Of course, this, we understand why this is so important. This is what saves us. This is the thing that saves humanity if we just believe. 
Jesus Christ is the Son of God, came in the flesh, died on that cross. He is the anointed one, the Messiah. This is what overcomes the world. This is what overcomes sin. This is what uh, gives you eternal life, that relationship with the Father. You've got to have this. There's no more important subject in all of humanity that we know in, in all of the the thousands of years of time that we've been on the earth, there's nothing more important than Jesus Christ, hallelujah, and him crucified, praise God, and risen again. So he is, he's trying to make a, a case. I'm thinking, you know, in a, a court case. So you, you're trying to lay down the evidence, and that's what he's doing. So we've received the testimony of men, but the testimony of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. One commentator says it this way, since we are in the habit of receiving the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater and therefore should be received. Hallelujah. Verse 10, he that believes on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believes not God hath made him a liar because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. So, again, one of those, those doctrines we take for granted that Jesus is the Son of God, but he's just hammering it over and over. We've got to get this, that Jesus is the Son of God. So he that believes on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. So we have external uh, uh, testimonies that prove that Jesus is, he came in the flesh, he's the Son of God, and, and, and uh, he's a Christ. But now he's saying, once you're born again, you also have a testimony in yourself. You have the Holy Ghost testifying to this truth. Of who Jesus is. So he that believes on the Son of God hath the witness, again, testimony or uh, uh, to testify within oneself that he is uh, God. Jesus is the Son of God. Now, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar. In other words, uh, that's another way of saying if you don't believe this, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you're calling God a liar. Okay? That is serious. That's, that's blasphemy. This is how serious it is. And, and you have to remember, of course, we're dealing with a, a, a nation, uh, particularly the, the nation of Israel, where a large majority rejected the Messiah. And even today, a large majority of the nation of Israel, the Jewish uh, race, have still uh, rejected the Messiah. They say that they're following the Father, but they reject the Son. Well, you, you can't do that. If you're really following the Father and you're, you're sincere, you're going to follow the Son. You're going to accept the Son and vice versa. So there's no uh, accepting one and rejecting the other, okay? So he that believes not God, ha God, he's calling God a liar because he believes not the record that God gave of his son. Verse 11, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Praise God. He that hath the son has life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. All right, so this is what it's all about. This is the whole crux of the whole thing, is when you believe in the Son, you have eternal life. Again, eternal life is not talking about a duration of time. It's talking about a quality of life. It's talking about a relationship with God. It's talking about knowing God. That's what it's all about. All our knowledge about God comes through Jesus Christ. It comes from Jesus Christ. It's all, He is the center of all things in God's universe. It's all through Him. He is the, 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 the high priest, the mediator, the, the bridge between God and man. So this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and his life is in his son. In other words, if you don't have the son, you don't have life. If you do have the son, you do have life. There, again, there's only two kinds of people on the earth. There's only two races of people on the planet, and that is those that have life because they believe in the son and those that don't. Now, this, is, this, is, this has to be clear. He that hath the Son has life, but he that hath not the Son hath not, hath not life. Okay? This has to be clear that, that Christianity is exclusive. God excludes. You are not going to heaven. You're not part of the family. You are not born again if you've rejected the Son. See, there are people that say, well, yeah, I, 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 I believe Jesus existed. I believe he was a good man, and, and, and I believe if I, if I, if I you know, do do good, God will accept me in heaven. No, you'll never make it. You have to believe something specific. You have to believe in the Son. See, we, we don't die because of our, our sins as much as we die because we either, uh, well, because we reject the Son of God. We rejected Jesus. 
that is the crux of all things for salvation. It's the only source of eternal life. We have to believe on Jesus Christ. So it's, it's about what do you do with the Son. You reject him, you are excluded from the kingdom of God. We have no fellowship with those of the world who reject Jesus Christ. We're not, we're, you know, some people say, oh, you know, we're all the, the children of God. Uh, the, like the Oprah people and, the, and the, all the, oh, we're all children of God. No, we're not. There's, there's, you're only children of God if you've been born of God, if you've been born by the, the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of grace through Jesus Christ. We're not all brothers and sisters. Humanity is a bunch of brothers and sisters. Let's join arm in arm. That's, that's nonsense. We're not the same. We are, we are of completely different origins. Verse 13, it says this, So these things have I written unto you, that you believe on the name of the Son of God. Hallelujah. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. It's funny, he repeats himself. That you believe on the name of the Son of God and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. <laughs> you see, he's repeating himself over and over. He's making the case. He's building the evidence. You've got to know this. And once you know this, you're established in this. The, the devil can't ever convince you that you're not saved. You know that you know you believe he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He came in the flesh, died on that cross. All right, so these things, th th this, this, is, this is why John wrote the book. You know, we, we talked about he wrote it to refute docetism, which is, which is true. Uh, but this is, th he's saying in, in his own words, these things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God. We know that name. It's the only name whereby men can be saved, the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, so to, to believe in the name, of course, is to believe in, in the person, Jesus Christ. So this is why he's writing this book, that you might believe on that name, the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. So again, this book was written to, to give the believer assurance that they are born again, that they are believers. You reject Jesus, you're not born again, you accept Jesus, you are born again, you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. It, it just repeats himself. All right, so another little, little note here. It says, in that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Uh, it actually, that is in the present tense, meaning we are to continue to believe. In other words, it's not something we, we, we just do one time, but it is, it is now something we do every single day, a continual faith in the Son of God. Not just a one-time event. It is an ongoing thing, literally for all of eternity. We're continuing to, continuing to believe on Jesus. Verse 14, it says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. All right, hallelujah. This is uh, just an awesome verse. The word confidence literally means a freedom of speech, but it's also translated boldness or openness. We should, of course, this is a verse about prayer. We should have a, a boldness in our prayer. Hallelujah. We, we can approach the throne of God and ask for help, ask for grace in our time of need. Praise God. And we know, absolutely know, he hears us. How can we know that? There's, there's the qualifier here. Uh, we know that we have, uh, let me go back. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So there's the qualifier. If we ask according to his will. Number one, we do have to ask. You know, well, God loves me. He, he's, he, we don't have to ask. He's just going to take care of me. Well, no, he, 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 we do have to ask. Well, so understand that. But we also have to ask according to his will. This is so important. Well, let me start with this. We have to ask according to his will. Well, where is his will? His will is his word. Okay? We have to ask according to what he has given us. We can't ask for things outside of his word. Well, uh, you know, people ask for all kinds of silliness, all kinds of ridiculous things. I want, 
Oh, I like her. She looks good. I, God, can I have her? Well, no, because you're married. Two, she's married. You, you, you can't just, you know, you understand. So we, we have to ask for things that are in line with the word of God. The, uh, they, they can't be contrary to, to, to his will, which is, which is scripture, of course. But this is, a, this is a big area where, you know, people can, can just take part of this verse or, or even some of the other verses uh, in the Bible, when, which makes it sound like you can just have anything you want. It, you, you know, you, can just, you, you got a blank check. You can just write whatever you want on that blank check, and, and, and God's going to deliver. That's not how it works. We have to ask according to his will. It has to be scripture. For, it, it can't contradict scripture, number one. Uh, but it must be according to the word of God. This is where some people have gotten off into all kinds of weird ideas. Well, all you have to do is just say what you want, and you can have it. Well, I can say all kinds of things, but I'm not going to get them, okay? I have to, if I'm going to say something, I better say what the scripture says. I pray, in other words, what the scripture says. Hallelujah. It has to be the word of God. And I'm just going to use some strong language here just to start, well, I confess I, I've got this and I confess I got that. And just saying, you know, I, I confess I'm going to win the lottery. I confess I've, I'm going to get a, a, a Bentley. I'm going to, and just start confessing all kinds of stuff. And you don't have scripture. You don't have the word. You don't have a foundation. It's witchcraft. You, you, you can't just make stuff up, write a blank check and say, this is what I want. All right. It doesn't work that way. You must align your words, your will, your prayer, what this is talking about, with God's word. So that's the only way we can have the assurance of this promise of being true. The only way. So this qualifies all the other scriptures, you know, about prayer, about, about uh, uh, you, you can uh, have faith and move the mountain, all these kinds of things. It's all qualified under this. So you can't just take one scripture magnify it and and reject uh, the other parts of the bible the bible is a is a consistent book that agrees with itself but you've got to take the whole message of the new testament not just one scripture take it out of place and say oh, i believe for everything you, you can't do that you have to have scripture okay, really that's that's i call it witchcraft because that's exactly what wicca does witches literally do that they believe in seances and saying things and doing things and, and, and you do all these actions and motions and saying things and, and playing with all kinds of weird elements and, uh, and concoctions and so forth, and, and, and they believe they're going to have it. But that is obviously contrary <laughs> to Scripture, witchcraft. So we don't want to do that. We say we, we, when we need something, we want something, we go to the Word and say, does the Word say this is, this is for me? What does the scripture say? And, and also, let me add this. It has to be properly interpreted scripture. Of course, people will take a scripture, twist it around, and give themselves a blessing. You know? So it, it has to be properly interpret, interpreted as well. So it says, if we know that he hears us, uh, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition we desired of him. That is still awesome. We just pray, and we know that he answers our prayer. It's absolute. There's no question about it. God is going to do what he said he's going to do in his word, what, he's, what the scripture says. Absolutely, we know we can have, so that's why we can have this confidence, this boldness that we can approach God because we know he hears us as we pray according to his will. Hallelujah. So uh, I've gotten in the habit uh, of, of when I need something, I, I go get the scriptures. You know, if I need healing, I go get all the scriptures on healing and, and just stand on the scriptures on healing. Or whatever it is I might need. I need some wisdom. I need some direction from God. Well, there's scriptures on that. I can go to the word and says he will give you wisdom freely, openly. He will give you the wisdom you need for, you know, whatever decisions you need to make and, and so forth. So go to the word and you'll find the will of God. Then you can have great boldness and then you're going to see prayers answered. That's why a lot of prayers are not answered. Obviously, there people pray according to, to fleshly carnal desires, gratification. And God is not obligated to answer any of those prayers, not at all. has to be according to the word. I could spend a lot of time there, but I don't have time. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, 
I do not say that he shall pray for it. So it talks about uh, two types of sin. There's a sin that's unto death, talking about the second death. We're talking to Christians here. So this is completely contrary to the, the, the uh, doctrine, once saved, always saved. Well, well, no, there is a sin unto death. For Christians, you can still lose your salvation. Okay? There's a sin that is unto death. And he says, don't pray for that. Now, if you, if you see a sin that's not unto death, and he didn't define it here. We'll get into it in a minute. Uh, you're supposed to pray for your brother. If you see your brother do something wrong, you don't, you know, go around telling everybody about it, you know. You know, it, it, that, that's, that's wicked. No, you pray for him, that God would, would help them, that God would uh, bless them and, and bring them out of that. So if any man see a brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he'll ask or pray, and she, he'll, he shall give him life. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he should pray for it. Let, uh, I'm not going to have us turn here because we don't have time. But uh, I'm going to turn here. Hebrews 6 talks about, and, and I'll just give you this for a homework assignment. You can read Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. Uh, uh, Hebrews 6, I believe, talks about a qualifier for the sin unto death. And I just don't have time to really get real deep into this. But in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. It says this, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. So I believe these are qualifiers of, of, of the sin unto death where, where one can lose their salvation. For those, it is impossible for those who, who were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted of the good word of God and of the powers of the word to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So uh, one example of this, uh, I wish I had time to get into this. In Mark chapter 3, you know, the, the Pharisees were opposing Jesus and he was casting out devils and they said, you're doing that by Beelzebub. What he was doing was casting out devils by the Spirit of God. But they're saying, you're doing it by the devil. And Jesus warns them and says, you're coming close to blaspheming the Holy Ghost. You cross that line, there is no return. There's only eternal damnation, what we call the second death. There's, there's no coming back from that. So he's warning them, don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Uh, he that shall blaspheme the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. So this is a, a grave warning to us, of course, that we don't ever want to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And, and uh, again, I don't have time, but those are the qualifiers that I read to you out of, out of Hebrews 6. So you have to have a, a, a knowledge of the Word of God, of the power of God, have, have partaken of the, the heavenly uh, gifts. So... Um, we don't want to ever blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You know, people, I'll just say it this way, people go very close to doing so when they talk about the powers of the Holy Ghost like tongues and say tongues is of the devil. Man, that is so dangerous. Uh, there, there are ministers that are out there just blasting all, really all the gifts of spirit, not just tongues, to certain ones. And I mean, they just really walk the line. And, and they, you just, you don't want to do that. You, you don't want to call the things of God the things of the devil. You don't want to call the move of God something from the devil, okay? Man, that is so dangerous. And he says, you can't pray for these people. Why? Well, there's no point. They're already lost. You can't come back from that one. You know, you don't want to do it. So it's a grave warning, but I got to keep moving. All unrighteousness is sin. There's a sin not unto death. We know that uh, whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Okay? So all unrighteousness or all wrongdoing is sin, right? And we, we've all sinned, even since we've become born again. There's nobody around that's not sinned because they became a Christian or since they've become a Christian. We've all messed up, and, and, and there's, they're not sins unto death. If, if you were to commit a sin unto death, you would knowingly do it. You would do it purposefully. It talks about in Hebrews 10, which I didn't get to, it talks about uh, counting the, the blood an un, uh, unholy thing, okay? Trampling underfoot the Son of God. 
doing despite unto the spirit of grace. So this is someone that knowingly, purposefully hates God. I guess that's the only way I could say it. Turns their back on God, on the things of God. And, and so, you know, a, a Christian would never do something like that. Call the, the blood of God a uh, common thing, an unholy thing. Trample underfoot the Son of God and do despite to the Spirit of grace or blaspheme the Holy Spirit. A Christian, it, by nature, could never, ever do such a thing. So when someone does such a thing that was once a Christian, they, and they've qualified, they've, they met the qualifications in Hebrews 6, they've, they're lost. They're lost forever. Okay? So the, all, all unrighteousness is sin. There's a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Praise God. He, and that doesn't mean that you never sin. It's saying uh, uh, it is not your habit to sin. Okay? Your, your, your lifestyle is that of wanting to please God. And yes, you slip up from time to time. Nonetheless, uh, it is not your habit. It is not your nature. It is not your desire ever to sin. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself. And that wicked one touches him not. Well, uh, he that is begotten of God keeps himself. Uh, that means uh, not that you're able to, to keep yourself from sinning. It's, it's that you are in the process of, of working with the Holy Ghost to, to renew your mind, to transform your mind, to, to be changed, to be sanctified, change into the image of Christ. So, you know, you're making slip-ups from time to time, but yet you're moving forward. You're pressing into the direction of always, always, always wanting to obey God and, and pursuing God. That is your lifestyle. That is your habit of life. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself. Again, we, don't, we can't do this in ourselves. We need grace. We need the Spirit of God to be able to do that, to, to walk a lifestyle of, of holiness and sanctification. So it is, it is by God's grace as we're walking with him. But the point is you keep yourself, meaning you're making the, the, the choice to, to agree with God, to, to agree with the Holy Spirit, to walk that life out, to, to walk in the direction of obedience with your, with your ent entire life, okay? So y you keep yourself, you, you're making a decision to, to follow the Spirit of God, to do what God tells you to do. And that wicked one touches him not. In other words, the, the, the devil can't destroy your life. He can't kill you, he can't touch you. I mean, uh, not that he can't tempt you, he'll tempt you, but he can't actually do anything to you, hallelujah, because you're pursuing after God. And if you mess up, of course we know we can confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us. Cleansing meaning the devil can't touch us. Okay? Now, if you, if you get into sin and, and you stay in sin, you, you, what we call backslidden state, well, the devil can come after you. You've opened the door. And the devil is going to try to kill you. He's going to try to destroy your life. And if you don't repent, that is possible. So, uh, the wack, but for the normal Christian, all of us here, I believe, we're pursuing after God. We want the things of God. We're seeking the things of God. So the wicked one cannot touch us, cannot destroy us. Verse 19, we're almost done. And we know that we are of God. Hallelujah. Again, that's, that's the assurance that we've got to have at all times. We are of God. The wicked one can't touch us. We are of God. And the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him, that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. All right, so we know that we're of God. He's, he's given us five chapters to give us assurance that we are of God. We're children of God because of what we believe, not because of who we are or what we've done or haven't done, because we believe because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So the whole world, again, a uh, 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 con contrast, two types of people, those that are lying in wickedness, you know, there's, there's, and then there's us. Well, the people that are in wickedness don't even know that they're in wickedness. They, they often say, well, I'm a good person. I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't killed anybody. Uh, no, you're in wickedness. Whether you realize it or not, you're, you're, you're in the devil's hands. They don't even know it. They're, they're being used, manipulated. They're slaves to the devil, slaves to sin. The devil is their master, and they don't even know it. Some do, but for the most part, they don't know of their slavery. They've got to have someone bring the light of the gospel that will open their eyes, enlighten their eyes to the truth that they need Jesus Christ. So the, the whole world lies in wickedness. Okay, You're, you're only in, in one system or the other, the world system of wickedness or God's system. 
And we know that the Son of God has come. Of course, and hath given us an understanding. So that's, that's what he's doing, is in enlightening us, giving us an understanding of who Jesus is. This in itself, knowing, having an understanding of who Jesus is, is eternal life in itself. And we're going to continue to grow in that eternal life the more we understand about God's word, who Jesus is, and what he's done for us. So that understanding is, is uh, by definition, uh, uh, life itself as well. It's eternal life the more we, we know, the more we understand. That we may know him that is true, Jesus, and we are in him that is true. Glory to God. So know him, and we are in him. In him is a fixed position. Glory to God. The devil can't move us out of that position, no matter what he does. We are, we are settled in Christ. Glory to God. The devil can't move us because, you know, the devil's not stronger than God. We are in God's hands. Nothing the devil can do can move us from our fixed position of being in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. So we're in him. That is true. Even uh, his son, God's son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So here's a, really a definition. He's giving you a definition of eternal life. The definition of uh, this is what Jesus died for. So we could have this. So this is where we need to, to focus on understanding what it is. What is eternal life? We're in him, in his son, Jesus Christ. And we know him, being in him and know him. That's eternal life. We'll be growing in that for all of eternity. That's eternal life in Christ and knowing more about Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Then the last verse, verse 21 interesting way to close the chapter to close i mean to close the letter he says little children keep yourselves from idols amen amen means truly or so be it and of course uh, uh I, I think it's interesting he, he calls us little children he calls the readers little children not just children little children okay <laughs> well, I mean, we you, you think oh man yeah I'm in, i i know so much about god i'm in, i'm in i'm in uh, the doctorate degree I, I'm, I, I'm a master in the things of God. No, you're just little children. You, you haven't even got out of kindergarten yet. We haven't even got started yet in understanding the things of God. We've got all of eternity, so there's no rush. But, but the point is, don't, don't think of yourself highly, more highly than you ought to. We are little children. Of course, we're to keep ourselves from idol. Idol, idols are things that would uh, uh, come between ourselves and God, between our, between our relationship with Jesus Christ between that eternal life you don't want to cut off that eternal life that we have with jesus christ so keep yourself from things that would hinder you from from the sins and the weights of the world and the things of the world that you can uh, uh promote to a place where that you spend more time doing that than, than spending time with god you you you, you focus more on that so it can be tv it can be video games it can be it can be just about any pleasure that this world may offer Keep yourselves from idols, and of course, it means literal idols as well, not just metaphoric idols, which, which means, you, you know, follow other gods. And, and that might seem obvious, but it needs to be said, because there are people that are supposedly Christian churches, they, at least they call themselves Christian churches, that are mixing in Islam and Christianity, or mixing in New Age uh, philosophies like Buddhism and Christianity. And these are some of your... Uh, uh, um, denominational churches they, they call themselves you know sometimes a episcopalian or, or baptist or or and and i don't think the baptist had anything to do with them but nonetheless they, i mean they, they would give the appearance that they are genuine churches but when you get in there it, it, you understand that they're trying to mix things and and of course this is this is the the lie that the devil is pushing in this last day this last hour is that all pathways lead to god now you can't get to Buddhism and get to God. You can't go through Islam. You can't go through Confucian. You, you can't go through Taoism. You can't go through anything else. There's only one way to God. There's only one name given among men whereby we can be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ. There's no other way to the Father. He is the way, the truth, the life. There's no other way except Jesus Christ. So with that, we close that Bible study, and our time is up. So a reminder, uh, next week, no Bible study. The week after that, no Bible study. The week after that, we start back up the new year with Breon preaching at 8 o'clock. Week after that, we start with the book of Mark at 7 o'clock going forward. 
Again, you'll hear that again over and over. Let's um, close out. Praise the Lord. Anybody get anything out of that? Glory to God. Amen, I did. Thank you for joining us for the Christ Unveiled webcast. If Christ Unveiled Ministries is being a blessing to you, please consider supporting our efforts, and we continue to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. Christ Unveiled Ministries, your church home on the Internet.